Hi YouTube, I'm Reddit user Dirty Crow. I, sub I subscribe and post a lot to the R Woodworking subreddit and I do a thing called Intarsia. I get a lot of questions about how that's done and so I thought I would go ahead and make a video taking you through like a beginner's tutorial on how to put these pieces together and yeah, we're gonna give it a shot. Please bear with me, I've never made a video before so there's probably gonna be some editing issues Hopefully there's no sound issues. Um, <laughs> wish me luck. For the very first project, just to give you a sense of basics and principles, I think you guys will be able to see this. I chose just a very simple flower, very simple rose, all done out of a piece of California redwood that I'm more or less just going to do out of one piece. What I did is once I had my picture selected, I projected my MacBook screen to my TV and then hung a piece of tracing paper over the TV and just traced out my pattern. From there to get the paper onto the wood you'll need some carbon paper. You can pick that up in just about any office supply store. It used to be used for typewriters for making forms in duplicate or triplicate but yeah, even though we don't use typewriters anymore they still have it around. And that looks like this, front and back. And you want to take that dark colored side and put that right down on top of the wood. Put your pattern right on top of it. And then you just take a piece of uh, any kind of pencil, writing utensil, anything you like, and trace over it, pressing firmly. You'll see that that's the mark I just made right there. And that's how you transcribe. That's how you get from paper to wood. Here's the part where I have to stop and make a confession. So I thought about whipping this up really quick as a project and just sort of walking you through quickly how I did it. And it occurred to me just now that I'm taking some shortcuts that I should probably make you aware of to be explicit about. Um, as I said, I cut this entirely out of one piece of wood. It's not quite cut out yet. Um, and that has some disadvantages. Uh, first and foremost, the disadvantage it has is in color variation because it all comes from one block of wood. Um, it all ends up being the same color unless you want to use stains. Um, to sort of show you a more traditional form, I'm actually not going to cut this one out um, of this piece of wood. I'm going to cut it out of a piece of dark cedar so you can see a contrast. The other disadvantage that I'm going to highlight when I change woods for this is in grain direction. Because I cut it out of one piece of wood, all of the grain just goes vertically and that works in some spots like right here for example and up here but if I were to have been a little bit more discerning about it I might have taken this piece of wood and drawn the pattern on more at an angle so that it highlights the curve there same thing with the other side coming from the opposite angle um, but I didn't do that I did it entirely out of one piece of wood and so you kind of lose some of those options for um, artistic approach. And since I'm talking about shortcuts, um, I should at least point out one of the advantages to doing it this way. If you make multiple pieces out of a single block of wood, then when you do go around to putting it together, that cut right there is pretty seamless. Those pieces hold together very well. Taking this piece and making it out of a separate piece of wood means now I have to match that line right there with the actual line right there and I'll show you how to do that when we get there. What I'm going to do here is put the pattern, I like the tracing paper patterns because you can see right through them to where the grain is and just kind of collectively take that rose and decide what direction I want the grain flowing putting it on a piece of the board that I happen to like, or in my case more frequently, where I'm going to conserve wood. That's where I want it. That's the grain direction I want. So I'm just going to tack this down so that it doesn't move around while I'm tracing it. Take that carbon paper, shove it behind there. Trace that out. One last little trick to get it all lined up properly is you shouldn't just rely on the line on the pattern to make sure that 
your pieces fit together. Uh, it's always best, whenever possible, to take what you've got and set it directly against where you want to go with it and then just trace it out. Um, you can be kind of careless with these lines, the, the ones on the outside because nothing's going to be attached to them, but that line that's going to be touching this rose to that stem has to be perfect. And there we go. We've got different colors. We've now got different grain directions working in our favor. Um, I'm probably not going to do any of this and it has everything to do with this seam right here. I'm imagining having, it's only going to be a quarter inch piece of birch that's backing this thing and it's very likely to just snap off right there. So I'm just going to omit this part and this is what our final product is going to be based off of. In the interest of being thorough, let's talk about some of our goals for sanding. The first thing I'm going to do is just take a layer off of the top because the top is pretty rough and you take a layer off and you get to see the much cleaner, shinier, new wood underneath. And the other thing that I'm going to do is take a layer off the back side to create a little bit more stability and evenness. You can see that that is, you know, it's not flat because it's an old fence picket that's been worn in the rain. So that's, that's a preliminary sand. It gets rid of all the pencil marks and everything looks bright and new and I'll show you um, a side by side after I do that. And then the second part is the shaping. To do that, you need to kind of envision what it is you want this to look like or what, what a rose would look like in real life. So I'm going to round out all the edges here, but I'm also going to try to put an indent in this piece right here, right there, so that it gives the appearance of sloping towards center. And that's going to be sort of a common theme in a lot of these. I'm going to slope towards center. I'm going to round out the inside. I'm going to round out the outside. And it'll start to take on that more of a, I've heard it described as balloon or even bubblegum shape. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the unsanded part of the rose along with a rough sand part of the rose. If I go ahead and take this guy out of here, I'm going to drop this down to the table level where you can see that in order to get the angle that I wanted, I set this on the sander like that at an extreme angle to get that sort of drop. I've also rounded out the inside a little bit roughly with the sander. There's a spot that the sander could not get to right here. That's going to be done with a knife or with just my thumbnail and some sandpaper. But this is this is a rough sand. In order to get the more finished sand, there's there's no shortcuts there. It's just sandpaper and a lot of patience. I brought you down here to table level so that you can see the project flat and get a better visual of how I want to try to increase depth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take like the side pieces here and I'm just going to put a little quarter inch piece of material underneath them so that when I reassemble it, you'll be able to see different things are going to pop up at different heights at a depth. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay this thing on top of there, trace it out, cut it out, glue this to the back of that, and I'll show you a clip of it when I'm done. Here we are back at table level. If I knock these guys out of the way, you can see this just resting on top of those quarter inches, uh, quarter inch pieces of birch. And then as I kind of pan up here, you can see the depth that that is created. I've got it all disassembled so you can kind of have a look at it. I've got the edge of that thing painted black just like I said I would. I've got the entire piece sitting on top of a much larger piece so I can make a backing for the whole thing. up on the end here just a couple of last things I'm going to sand the edges of this so you don't end up with this really kind of fuzzy edge I'm going to glue the whole thing together for a long time for, for decades I use 
Elmer's wood glue. It's a solid glue. There's nothing wrong with it. This is how we're going to attach the wood to the backing. It's just glued together. Um, but this stuff is pretty strong, pretty powerful. It'll last at least 15, 20 years without any issue. I haven't had any issue yet, but I mean, that's about as far as I can vouch for it. Recently, um, I switched glues. I didn't have this at my local hardware store, so I found myself picking up this Tripe Bond 2 premium wood glue, and frankly, I like this a little bit better. I can't speak to its longevity. I've only used it for a couple of projects, but it's a little tackier. When you go to actually put wood down on these backings, the trouble with this stuff is it'll it'll have be it'll be sliding around like a hockey rink, and things are just moving and shifting, and you don't want that when you're trying to get things locked down in a permanent type way. Um, this stuff has a pretty good work time. You can you can move it around for five or six minutes, but it holds. It's got a little bit more grip to it. So recently, I've been liking this: sanding, painting, gluing. And then we'll talk about the actual, like, final steps. We're just about there. finishing steps. First thing I'm going to do is put one of these little backings on it right now because I don't want to, I'm going to have to flip it upside down to nail that thing on and I don't want to damage the final coat and not be able to do anything about it during that process. So we put the backing on now and then I'm going to sign it. I just, I always sign my work. I could use a wood burner, and I have in the past, but I don't really see a huge difference in quality between that and just one of these nice little art pens. I try to find a brownish color with a real fine tip, and it does just as good a job, and it's a lot faster. So what you saw me doing was using a rag to get most of that done, but if you look real close, you can still see there's a whole bunch of little gaps in the coat, and that's where the paintbrush comes in. As far as application techniques go, <clears throat> I use this, and it's less that I'm painting it on, and more that I'm just getting a glob and dropping big droplets into these little crevices and letting gravity do most of the work. And then this is just kind of a scraping tool. So for the initial coat, there's the first coat, I use a liquid polyurethane called Verithane. And it makes a fine sealant, but it doesn't quite give the last pizzazz, the last final finish for that. I use a Rust-Oleum uh, Crystal Clear Enamel high gloss polyurethane. Um, I've had a lot of success with the matte as well. The matte is nice, but I like it when it looks wet. This stuff, this stuff doesn't take very long to dry. Um, five, six hours, I think as few as three. Sometimes I leave it overnight. This stuff dries pretty quickly, but the smell doesn't dissipate for a while. So once I coat it in this polyurethane, in the Rust-Oleum, it's probably best to leave your project in the shop or outside or some other aerated area where it'll be able to breathe for two or three days before you want to bring it in the house. Well, that's it. A finished Intarsia Rose. Thank you very much for sticking it through this entire video. I deeply appreciate a like and wouldn't mind if you gave me some feedback. This is my first video. I uh, almost didn't make it here. Honestly, the video was more work than, uh, than the wood project for me. Uh, I lost a bunch of clips somewhere along the line, but I think we made it. I think it's clear. Please give me some feedback and uh, hope I was helpful. Until next time, happy building.